Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Calvary Wallingford. We're going to get started here a little late, as usual. I'm going to read us a psalm. This is going to be Psalm, psalm 138. The Psalm of David, who we're learning about as we go through First and Second Samuel. So, Psalm 138. I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will sing your praises before the gods. I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your mercy and your truth. For you have made your word great according to all your name. On the day I called, you answered me. You made me bold with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth will give thanks to you, Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth, and they will sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord, for the Lord is exalted, yet he looks after the lowly. But he knows the mighty or the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will reach out with your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Your faithfulness, Lord, is everlasting. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, forever. We thank you that just as you were the God of David, you're the God of us. And we look to you for strength. We look to you for mercy. We look to you for all of our hope, all of our trust we put in you. So we pray that we, as we go through our service today, that you would prepare our hearts to worship, to glorify your name in song, and to hear from uh, your word, to hear truth, uh, to hear from you and, and how we should live our lives. So we thank you for this body and the group gathered here today, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand up together. If I don't praise your name, even the rocks will cry out. If I don't praise your name, even the mountains will shout. So
Jesus, you are Lord of all. You guys can be seated. seated but train your mind on the goodness of God and talk back to your feelings are they telling the truth Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And meditate on his goodness in your life. Meditate on the goodness of the gospel story. Take some time to think about it. What is the gospel? meditate long enough and think long enough, which we hope to do this morning together, we come to realize there is hope. All is not lost. His goodness is all around. There's still love. There's still peace. There's still goodwill. It is well with my soul. Now think about maybe a place that's stuck in your life. And can you say, even if you don't feel it, can you say, it is well with my soul? In light of the gospel, it is well with my soul. I surrender. It is well. I let it go. I don't need to control anymore. Fix it. Just let it go. It is well. Holy Spirit, I need your touch more than ever. Jesus, I need your love, and I'm desperate for more. Sing that again, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I need. I cannot hide 
I was reading yesterday that um, the term psychosis comes from a place of not being able to connect to reality, not being able to face truth, because truth can be a really scary thing to face. Life is hard, it's brutal. We have all sorts of mechanisms to survive and survive uh, I guess you could say psychologically to avoid the things that we know have mastered us. It can cause some real disconnect. Disconnect with self and disconnect with others. More importantly, disconnect with God. And this is why the Christian sacrament of confession you could say is so powerful confession bids us to be honest and it says when we do it we'll be healed as as uncomfortable as confession is as scary as it can be the Bible promises that on the other side of it on, on the other side of this fearless look at the truth is healing, is wholeness. What is it that you're running from? Can you be honest right now before God? Maybe it's, yeah, I blew it here. 
Or maybe it's, yes, this person did hurt me. That's true. But I also reacted. And that's on me. It doesn't take away what they're responsible for. But it doesn't excuse me either. Sometimes that line gets blurry. Confession is just agreeing with God. Yeah. It's being true to yourself. It's when we decide not to confess, we engage in something called self-betrayal, where we go against what we know is true, and it kind of, it has a way of tweaking our, ourselves. We don't live in reality anymore. It can cause some real damage. I'm inviting us now to have a moment of clarity, to be brave enough to face the truth, to ask the Holy Spirit to disentangle the confusion, to show you where someone else ends and where you begin, perhaps. It also means acknowledging when someone else has hurt you. Sometimes on the opposite end of confession, we can take too much responsibility. We say, it's all my fault. Well, confession just means being honest. It means saying, no, I did this bit, and that's all mine. But this person hurt me. And it's the practice of forgiving them that sets us free. Take some time. Take some time to cleanse yourself, to heal and confess. Without you, I will fall apart Cause you're the one that guides my heart I'll oh, sing it out now Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you Cause you're My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Sing it again. Lord, I come and I confess. Lord, I come. Lord, I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest without you. And without you, I will fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart, my heart, God, my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you. And every hour I need you. You're my one defense, my righteousness, oh, God.
sin runs deep your grace is so much more where grace is found that's where you are and where you are lord i am free this holy Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. You're my one defense. You're my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you. temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay let's stand and sing this again teach my song to rise to you God so teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand, I will fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Sing it out. I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh. about us. We need you. Lord, we need you. Oh, we need you. Every hour we need you. You're our one defense. You're our righteousness. Oh, God, how we need you. Oh, help us, God. Oh, God, how we Oh, our God, how we need you, how we need you, oh, we need you, how we need you. Lord, that is our confession. Lord, and I pray that you would keep our hearts tender to that, because, Lord, the moment we think, I don't need God for this. It's the moment we begin to disconnect and wither away. Lord, keep us desperate. Keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Yeah, hang out. No, stick around. Stick around. Grab that mic. Hey, friends, come on. Come on in. Have a seat. Yeah. Ah, come on, guys, sit down. Have a seat. Oh, I ain't doing that. Grab your pastries and your coffee and your tea. Hi, honey. Do you guys know who Jameson is? Good morning. My, my good friend. Good hey, uh, Jameson, why don't you also tell us about lunch? Uh, today for lunch we're having uh, quiche, and the, uh, I picked quiche because it's Super Bowl Sunday, and I figured maybe Yeah, we want the Mariners to win, okay. right? <laughs> Mike loves the Mariners. <laughs> Can't believe they made it to, to February, The Super Bowl. Bro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. It's a long season. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, today's the day. Anyways, you know, food surrounding that event can, can challenge one's. Ability to cholesterol, yeah, to sleep well at night. Mm. Um, so I just went with quiche today. We'll have a, a broccoli and cheddar quiche or a sausage broccoli and cheddar quiche. However, we will have some chicken with buffalo sauce on them, uh, on it for wow. those that want to get started early. Um, what else we got? 
Bread. Bread, mm. that's right. Paul's been making the homemade bread. Have you guys had the homemade bread? Yeah. Paul's guys, making Paul that. is a biblical man. You know, John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. He's, yeah. he's taken that. Shall not live by bread that's alone. That's right. But having Paul's helps. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to have a meal there. Cool. Yeah. Hey, tell us about this. This is uh, exactly what it says it is. It's brought to us by Seattle's Union Gospel Mission, UGM. They work uh, in tandem here with Emmanuel for the men's shelter over there. And uh, as we integrate with Emmanuel and that men's shelter there and, and donate our time and energy to that, we get more connected. And now we're uh, connecting uh, and having a chance to connect even deeper with more people and more resources. Uh, coming up March 4th at University Presbyterian is this event, Engaging Homelessness in the U District. Now, we're not directly involved, I think, in U District ministry, but I mean, it's a small area, and it doesn't, you know, just because it's in the U District doesn't mean all of a sudden you're gonna slide out the door and say, well, that ain't us. Uh, it's it, it's a collaboration. It's a it's kind of like a um, exposition or something, if you will, for, for this type of thing. It's a gathering of people who are, uh, you know, putting forth their effort to to do this with homelessness uh, and help serve this community and help join in with the thing that UGM does so well. And uh, they're the best guides in this city towards uh, ministering to to the homeless. And I think. Uh, the problem we have with homelessness is, is we feel like it's on us, what can I do? And you all of a sudden have put yourself in a position of, of solo ability, like what can I do? And then you're on this platform all by yourself, well I can bring a pair of socks or I can, yes you can do all those things, but uh, the ministry as a whole is going to take every willing heart and set of hands and set of feet and, and we've got to come together and that's what this is an opportunity to do. It's an opportunity to remember that there's a team of folks out here uh, working to do this and, and that it's not just one person here and there um, throwing darts at uh, a very um, um, big deal, uh, you know, as a solution. It, it's going to take a group effort and uh, I'll be darned if, if uh, our church and Emmanuel and the other churches um, don't uh, don't get away with 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 this type of ministry, meaning not being able to participate, because um, the the other proposed solutions are just they're just trap doors in in a lot of ways for people. You know, just getting the homeless housing is not enough. Um, the powers and the, and the strongholds that are involved in this area are, are too great for just a material and a financial solution. So gathering God's people together uh, with a willingness to minister to the homeless is, is, is the order of the day, is the order of the era. Uh, and, and so that's what this is. Anybody can jump in. It's there, Saturday, March 4th. It's in the U District from 10 to 2. Um, you can scan that thing. You can come see me. I can give you a web address to register. Uh, if you'll do that, please, if you plan on attending, because they have a, a, a workbook uh, packet that they want to hand out, and they want to count heads for that. And, uh, and just get all the... Yeah, you can... You, I mean, up. you can even scan it right now. I think that'll work. Really? If you put your, your phone will focus and hit yep, that? Yep, if you put your camera on that... A little URL will pop up on your camera. Click it, and it'll go right to that. And then you will this is be what we do at restaurants these days. Yeah, you will menus. be controlled, and you'll have no way out of this ministry. Yeah, you will right. be guided and directed by the authorities. Yeah. and they'll know where you are at all this. times. Yeah, they will drone you yep. into service. Yep, it's great. Yeah, it's good. Okay, so please, you guys, please pray about this. Um, this ministry is not going anywhere. So let's 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 get together. I mean, if there's something holding you back, whatever it is. Honestly, I exhort you to take that barrier and put it before the Lord and say, is this, is this really uh, too big for me to, to, to get around in order to help out? Because we, 
we need everybody that, that has mm -hmm. half a heart of, of willingness to, to get in here and, and do this. And it's such a blessing, you guys. I don't shudder uh, one bit from Tuesday nights. I do t Tuesday night meals, and every time I, I come out, I feel lighter in my feet, lighter in my heart. Mm -hmm. It's just a blessing. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and it's an honor, because one of these days we're going to stand before God, and he's going to say, you know, what did you do? And, and, and you'll have an opportunity to say, well, you know, we did these things. And, and it's, I can't remember the name of the verse, but it, it's like serving the Lord Jesus directly in a lot of mm. ways. Matthew 25. Yeah. And, and what a blessing it is. I, I, don't know, I can't tell you. I'm, I'm just stupid blessed from doing it. So if you guys want to be stupid blessed too, please. Okay. Awesome. See Thank you. Yeah. You know, I, I think, too, they, they will teach you what's appropriate and what's not. If you're anything like me, that's a struggle for me. I see somebody that needs something, and my heart goes out to them. I want to help them, and I certainly want to help them in the name of Jesus. I want them to, to know the, the, the love of Jesus. But then there's another part of me that wonders, is this going to help, or is this going to enable? Is this going to... And so I find myself at this... I mean, it's a complicated situation. I find myself kind of with a, a kind of a war going on within my own heart. What do I do right now? I don't really know what's appropriate, what's not. And these guys will help you with that. The uh, Union Gospel Mission, they will help walk you through that so you'll know, okay, you'll kind of have some more discernment when it comes to those things. So... That's very important. Okay, we're going to take a little bit of a detour today um, because I took a detour this week. My, um, I was in Portland this week, and my train broke, and so they had to send another train. I take the train when I go to Portland, back and forth, and another train had to um, be... Anyway, I didn't get home till like, in the morning, um, and I was just toast yesterday, but I have something to give you that's not in Samuel. Turn to... Habakkuk. I want to tell you a little bit about Habakkuk. This is something that I've been thinking about a lot recently, and I think I've been thinking about it probably because I live in the same world that you live in, and you've probably been wondering the same thing too. We're actually going to be in chapter 3, and we can help dissect it together this morning because I think it's going to be really fun for us. But let me give you, let me, let me give you a little bit of background um, and a little bit of context so we can take a running start at this, and then I'm going to set you guys loose, and we're going we're gonna to observe some things together here that will be helpful. First, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for people like Habakkuk or Habakkuk or however you say his name. Thank you that he lived in a world that was just as or maybe more scary than our world is today. Thank you that he wrestled with the same questions. Thank you that he questioned you and he um, had some very frank and blunt dialogue with you. And thank you that you saw fit to put that in our Bibles. Thank you, Lord, for the humanity that's divinely inspired in our Bibles. And I pray, God, that you would give us comfort today and help us look through this world with the same lens that Habakkuk looked through his world. And I pray this, in, you guide us through this study in Jesus' name, amen. Um, Habakkuk lived um, somewhere between 640 and 615 B.C., um, very close to Babylon's invasion of the southern kingdom of Israel and Jerusalem. That happened in 586 BC. And um, Habakkuk saw that thing coming. It was only a few decades off of it actually coming to pass. He saw that coming. He saw that Babylon would <clears throat> rise up and revolt against the Assyrians and against Nineveh. He saw that they would take over. He saw that they would come down, that they would invade uh, Israel and Jerusalem. But here's what makes um, so a lot of prophets saw that. A lot of the minor prophets saw that. But here's what makes Habakkuk so unique. Nowhere in his book do you ever see him prophesying to people. You don't see him saying, thus saith the Lord to you, Israel, or to you, Babylon. That's all the minor prophets. They're speaking to people. Woe is you. Who do they're confronting. They're, they're bringing the word of God. Instead, um, 
Habakkuk is addressed to God himself. It is a back and forth conversation between Habakkuk and God. And it's written in a really interesting poetic genre. It's called lament. You know what it means to, you know, there's a whole, another prophet wrote lamentations, his name's Jeremiah, and it's this grief, it's a lament, it's sadness, it's a complaint, it's a grievance. That's uh, the poetic uh, kind of genre that we're dealing with here. And interestingly enough, um, there's a structure to this poetic genre of lament. There's actually three steps to a, a lamenting poem in the Bible. Number one, the first step is you lodge a complaint to God. That's number one. This is what it, if you want to know how to lament well, if you've got something going on in your life or some injustice that you see, or maybe you're scared about something and you want to you bring this to God in a great way, follow this structure. First, you lodge a complaint. That's number one. This is happening. Secondly, you'll see um, Habakkuk draws God's attention to the complaint. He says, don't you see? Don't you see? And then thirdly, you demand that God does something about it. That sounds very presumptuous of us, doesn't it? And yet that's what, you can find this in Habakkuk, you can find this in Job, you can find this in the, what we call the imprecatory psalms, where David or other psalmists are grieving about something, and the structure is basically the same. First, they lodge a complaint. I'm mad because of this. Secondly, they ask God, they, they call him to, to notice. Look at it. Don't you see? Look at this. Are you seeing what's happening here? And thirdly, they demand that God does something about it. And knowing this lament structure is really helpful for um, Habakkuk because it's actually the key to unlocking the book, if you understand that structure. Chapters 1 and 2 are a back and forth argument between Habakkuk and God. Okay? The, the prophet lodges two complaints and there are two responses. That's how it works. It's a very, it is a very um, easy structure to see. He lodges two complaints. His first complaint is that life in Israel has become just horrible. <laughs> That's his first complaint. He says, you can read about this in your first four verses, chapter, uh, verses one through four. Look, look uh, let's just, well, let me just show you. This is so great. I, did you notice my, my table? Isn't that nice? Because the pulpit was angled. I couldn't click it. St- Anyways, it doesn't matter, but I'm feeling like we're cruising right now. Okay, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, O Lord, must I call for your help? And you don't listen. Have you ever felt that way? I cry out to you, violence. (laughs) That was perfect. (laughs) Uh, I call out to you, violence, but you don't save. You ever feel that way? You're not doing anything here. I've been calling out to you, and you're silent. I've been asking you to do something, but you don't save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? It's pretty blunt. Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law, that's the word Torah in the Hebrew, the law is paralyzed. In other words, it's doing no good because it's being neglected. And because the Torah is being neglected, Justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. In other words, because no one's upholding the law, there's anarchy. There's no, uh, society is falling apart. It's unraveling because there's no, no one, everyone's ignoring your word. They're ignoring the law. And then there's God's response. God tells um, in verses 5 through 11, he says that he's very aware of the corruption that's in, within his own people, and he's going to do something about it. He's summoning this other nation, this nation called Babylon. He's going to summon them, and he's going to raise them up, and he's going to send them against his own people to judge Israel through this other nation, Babylon. That's God's response. Do you think 
Habakkuk is happy with that response or not happy with that response? He's not happy with that response. His, he goes back again. Habakkuk has a problem with this answer, so he brings another complaint. This is uh, verses 12 through 2, verse 1, where he says, but Babylon is worse than Israel. They're more corrupt. They're more violent. They have uh, deified their military power. They build their, their, they build their wealth on the backs of the poor. They exploit people's weaknesses. You think the Assyrians were violent, and boy, they were. I mean, history records that they took it to another level when it came to violence and brutality. But the Babylonians, they're just as bad. And this is the premise of the, this is, if you want to, if you want to know the question, if you want to boil it down into Habakkuk's question, maybe it's a question that you struggle with. I think you should, I think it makes, it would make sense if you did. How can I trust that you are good when you use evil to do your will? That is Habakkuk's problem. That's what he's bringing to God. How can I trust that you are a holy good God when you use evil. I mean, this is, this this is a lot of your story on an individual level. There's There's a confusing thing in your past where God did use it for your good, and yet you wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy. If you if you had or have you heard of people that had situations like that? I was raised in this traumatic, dysfunctional, abusive environment that hurt me so deeply. Yeah, God used it, but how can I possibly say I was grateful for that? It's just confusing to its core. And on one hand, I feel like we should be comforted to know that God just flat out puts this stuff in his Bible. He just says, look, it's right there. Habakkuk is going, you know, oy vey. (laughs) What is a Jewish person? Oy vey. What's going on here? How can I trust that you're good and holy? And um, God's response, God, this is in chapter 2, verse 2 on. We're going to make our way to our text here. It's a short little book. It's only three chapters long. God tells Habakkuk to get out some tablets. Sorry, I should probably move along with you. I mean, you got it up there, Mike. You might as well use it. And the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets. So he tells him to get out some tablets, chisel, and write down what he sees and hears. And the, if we were to keep going through this, he, see, he sees this vision of an appointed time in the future. Now, I want you to... This is going to frame all of life for us because this is an ongoing theme from the Exodus on all the way into the New Testament to the book of Hebrews. There's an event in the future that he says, Habakkuk, you are to wait for this event in the future. This event where I'm going to make all wrongs right. This event where I'm going to come and I'm going to, I'm going to judge Babylon as well. Because Babylon, in the minor prophets, but especially in Habakkuk, becomes kind of a generic nation to, enca- to, encaps- uh, to represent all human evil. Same with Gog and Magog in Ezekiel. It kind of, it, it is an actual place and an actual region, but it grows metaphorically in the text to represent all evil regimes. And basically what he tells Habakkuk here is that because of sin, all human nations become a Babylon. Because of the corruption that's in mankind and in the hearts of man, all, most all, all regimes become kind of Babylon-esque. And there will come a day in the future that God will make it right. And you're supposed to wait for that. So here's what I want to tell you. Um, well, and we'll see this in a, in a bit. But the, um, the nation of Israel is set free out of Egypt, the Babylon of the time, if you would. They're set free out of the slavery. And they're immediately thrust into what? A wilderness, yes, the wilderness where they travel. So they're, they, they're leaving point A and they're in transit to point B. And this is what God is telling Habakkuk. 
you want this place to be heaven, but it's not. You're, this, is, this is a wilderness. That's what this is. Let me ask you, what are some things that happen in a wilderness? And think wilderness without, don't think glamping. <laughs> don't even think camping. Think back then without what we've got. What, what, think, um, think when the West was being settled. What do you got out in the wilderness? Hunger and starvation. Hunger and starvation. Yes, absolutely. And yes, lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, oh my. yes. Dave? Yeah, there's no market, there's no economy. Yeah. What's that? Yes, you get, right, because there's so much pressure. Right, I mean, it brings out the worst in you. Yeah. What's that? There's no law. Yes. There's no one, there's no law. There's no order. It, it, it's, uh, it's crazy. Yeah. Weather extremes, absolutely. Um, now, let me say this. Biblically, it's kind of a mixed bag, right? Because in the wilderness, there were points of, of God's intervention. There were miracles. There were provisions. There were good things happening. Yeah, you remember, we're hungry, and this, you know, um, honeycombs came up on the, every morning on the ground. These, manna. Manna literally means, what is it? But it was this bread-like you know, Paul would have loved it. It was the bread-like substance with some honey in there, and they would, they would gather it, and they would eat it, right? Jesus, Jesus um, tagged onto that in chap, John chapter 6 when he said, I am the bread of life. I'm the one that sustained them through the wilderness. So these beautiful things happened. What else happened? They got sick of manna, and then, so what did God send? Quail, yeah. I mean, just right in the, in the strike zone, they could just right there and eat it. What else happened? What's that? Water, yes, water. Think of this. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people by the time they left, and their cattle. We're not talking about, you know, Moses touches this rock miraculously and this little oink, oink comes out and people have to... We're talking about a gusher that would sufficiently quench the thirst of a nation. So miraculous stuff, encounters with God, all of those things. But at the same moment, or at the same season, people died. It wasn't a happy ending for, for everybody. That's kind of the wilderness, isn't it? It's a mixed bag where it's on, on, on the sum, this, and the Bible would say, this is where you're at right now. For us, what's behind us is the past, is Jesus dying on the cross, but we're moving through, we're pilgrims, we're moving through, this is where Hebrews would pick this up, Hebrews chapter 4 specifically, and we're moving to, to the promised land. And this is what frames, we're in the wilderness, so when we see that Putin invades Ukraine, and we see an earthquake that takes out 12,000 people, like that, when we see disease that takes out our friends, when we go through heartache and betrayal, and we go through marriage problems, and our kids disobey and, and walk away from God and on and on and on it goes. The Bible would say, hey, remember, you're in a wilderness right now. It's the wild, wild west out here. So what does God tell him to do? Look at this. He says, but the righteous, it's a famous, famous verse. The, the New Testament quotes it, I think, three times. It was Martin Luther's favorite verse. But the righteous will live by faith. God is saying to Habakkuk, in this in-between time, in this wilderness time, those who are right with me live by faith. Live by faith. That's the key. For those of you that are traversing, that are transient, that are pilgrims moving through, that would be all of us, as if, if you're a follower of Jesus, you dare not set up camp here. Number one, in a wilderness, the moment you die or start dying is the moment you think, I should try to live here. The moment you stop. One of my favorite quotes from Winston Churchill in World War II is that if you find yourself in hell, keep moving. <laughs> I love that quote. It's so true. 
because the wilderness is not a place that you set up camp. The moment you think, this is what, this here is life. This is what it's all about. That's the moment you're going to start being very disappointed. My friend, um, Brady, who has now passed in, in heaven, passed away. This 21-year-old young man that recently passed away. He said that he wanted to live because he had so many more adventures. That's what he said on his deathbed. And so here's the thing. We hear that. And it just rocks us. Obviously, we lament. And that's okay. That's, God doesn't rebuke Habakkuk for feeling this way. Same with Job. Same with the imprecatory Psalms. You never see God saying, how dare you feel that way? How dare you say that? No, it's there. But God's response is, hey, you will see your son again. That's real. To the Bible, there's a, distant, there's a future destination that is not just something fun that we say. It's real. It's real. And Brady, right now, is having the most grand adventures of his life. That's real. Now, can you imagine not having that faith in this world? It makes my heart go out to folks that don't take the Bible seriously. It makes my heart go out to folks that, don't, that are living in the same world that I'm living in, but that think this is all it is. This is all there is. I think no wonder people give up. I think I would too. No wonder. I mean, you want to know how this, real this is, and no wonder people ditch their spouse and go on to somebody else. If this is, well, I only, have, I only got one shot at romance. One shot. This is all I've got. So I'm going to bounce because this is hard and I'm going to go find somebody else. What's going on? God would say, you think that this is home. It's not. It's a wilderness. And everything you're really longing for is over there, is at this future destination. If you find yourself in hell, keep moving. (laughs) Keep going and live by faith. That's the idea. Okay, well, let's go to chapter 3. Let's see what, what he sees. So Habakkuk's not too terribly stoked about that one either. So he, he ushers this incredible pr- prayer. Let me read it to you. You can follow up, follow on here. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, on, I don't know what, how to say that word, Shigianoth. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I want you, I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. What a beautiful line this is. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, probably a conflation with Mount Sinai. And then there's this thing way over here. It's this word Selah. Now here's what that means. It's like a musical note that means the rest. Except it's more than that. Uh, in our, uh, if you were to read a sheet of music and you were to see this note, it means to pause. But for them, it meant to stop and think about what was just said. In other words, don't keep reading yet. Stop and think about it. Meditate on what was just said. So, let's do it. Let's go back. I want you to think about this. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His, holy, his glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. Selah. What do you notice? Let's think about this. Okay, so it could be a reference to creation. Yeah. 
It, it's got to be a reference to something in the past, right? Because he's already complained throughout the book that it's not that way right now. And then he says, he starts referring, God came. I've heard of your fame, right? Yeah. Oh, it reminds you, yeah, it reminds you of uh, the prayer of Jesus. Yeah, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's kind of a surrendered type of a deal. Yeah, absolutely. Remind anybody of, what do you think he's referring to in the past? Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai is where they made the covenant. It's where they became a nation and where they cut covenant with God. Absolutely. And where did they just come out of? So uh, he's dealing with Babylon. That's the evil of his day. But he's remembering another evil empire, Egypt. Yeah. Absolutely. They had just been set free out of Egypt, an insurmountable foe. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard of that. He says, God, I stand in awe of your, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. And then he's his saying, do it again. Do that again right now. I re, we need a little bit of that right now. You've done it before. Do it again. Right? God came from Timon the Holy One from Mount Paran, so that's in the desert. That's actually right on the border of Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea, but there's overlap with the Sinai, with the Sinai Desert, the Paran Desert. But um, this is also a, a reference um, when he says Mount Paran. There was no Mount Paran. It was just the Paran Desert, so it's probably a reference to Mount Sinai. <clears throat> um, and notice, of course, the Hebrew parallelism. God came from Timon. The Holy One came from Mount Paran. That's, that's a Hebrew parallel uh, classic poetry. Uh, you might think, well, it doesn't rhyme. <laughs> and you might think, well, it must have rhymed in Hebrew. No, it actually <laughs> it doesn't rhyme in Hebrew either. Hebrew people rhyme ideas, not vowels. They rhyme ideas. So that's why you got this pairing. God, Holy One, Timon, Mount Paran. Okay, he'll do it again. His glory covered the heavens. His praise filled the earth. See, they're rhyming th ideas. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays of flashing from his hand were his power. What do we see here? Look at plagues went before him. What's that remind you of? Plagues of Egypt, yeah. What's he doing here? It's remembering how God has dealt with other evil things and other evil regimes. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. Do you remember when they were at, the, at Mount Sinai? And uh, this is chapter 19 of Exodus, and the glory of God came down on the mountain. This is mankind. You don't see like what you like if you went into an evangelical church on a Sunday morning, like, like ours. You don't see people at the mount here with their lattes, just comfortable as can be, looking over at the snacks. No, no, it was a scary experience. When was the last time you were scared to go to church because you knew the presence of God was there? We don't think like I don't get up in the morning and go. You know, the people here, they went to Moses and they said, you, you talk to him. <laughs> we don't, he's, whoa, it's, you know, it's earth shakes, it's lightning striking, the earth is shaking apart here. I mean, this is, the, this is God, this is God. Imagine that. Shake you to your core kind of thing. Very, very uncomfortable kind of thing. He made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled. The age-old hills collapsed. In other words, when God shows up, you better believe it, people will notice. He's not missed here. People know something's going on. He, his ways are eternal. It's not like people from the nation of Israel walked away and said, what do you think? Do you think that was God? It could, you know, maybe it was this. Maybe we were, it was the mushrooms we ate. Maybe, it was, you know, whatever. <laughs> they knew. There was just, it was not controversial. God is here. He stood. The earth shook. He looked and made the nations tremble, the ancient mountains. And he goes on. I saw the tents of Kushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. These are both desert places. Were you angry with the rivers, O, God, o Lord? 
Was your wrath against the streams? What are you guys thinking about? What's that make you think? What's that? Maybe the Red Sea? Except he's, what's, what's another river that parted? Jordan? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe this is a reference to going in and taking the promised land, maybe? Here it is. Did you rage against the sea? Mm hmm. When you strode with your horses and your victorious chariots? What's that making you think of? The Exodus, yeah, right. This is very Exodus language. You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. Selah. So wait, he's saying stop. Think. Meditate. What's that? Eden? Garden of Eden? Okay, where are you seeing that? Okay, oh, you're saying about the, the four rivers that came out of Eden? Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that could, that's interesting. Yeah, maybe. The mountains, the mountains saw you and writhed. I'm still thinking of the Exodus. The mountains are, you know, where he's quaking the mountain and it shook. Torrents of water swept by. Another uh, reference to either the Jordan or the Red Sea. Um, think of these plagues. God used Egypt, but he also... And remember, remember, what's so confusing about, what's the big conundrum about the Exodus story? Do you remember Pharaoh, that he's let my people go, but there's these really uh, frustrating verses in there that say, but God hardened his heart so that Pharaoh would not let him go? We were like, what do we do with that? <clears throat> Actually, I think there's six of them. Six references, three of which, I think it's almost half and half. Half are Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then the other half, and I'd have to go back and look, or you can go and check me on this. But there's, there's a ratio of Pharaoh hardening his own heart and then God hardening Pharaoh's heart. And the idea is this kind of exchange. It's since you're going to harden your heart, I'm going to use that momentum. I'm going to use the evil that you're choosing to get my way done. And plagues were sent. And this was all part of God's plan, of course. What else are you guys thinking about? Anything else? I don't want to move on and if, if you've got something to share. I'm thinking about Noah's flood. Okay. Explain. The ancient mountains crumbled and the ancient mountains mm. collapsed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Same idea, right? The earth was, so let's talk about that story with Noah. The earth was wicked. Human evil abounded. God regretted that he made them. There's that horrible, this is, this is uh, chapter 6 and 7 of Genesis. You know, he regretted that he made them. And so he's going to send water just like um, Exodus. There, water has this judgment and salvific kind of dual function. It reminds me of um, what we saw in the very beginning here, um, this beautiful phrase, in wrath, remember your mercy. Another way that the Bible doesn't seem to mind putting two ideas together that we usually consider two separate things, the Bible does not seem to mind kind of squeezing them together. They're not the same thing, but they, they're like friends that hold hands. Sometimes it's merciful to show wrath. And sometimes wrath is merciful. There's this idea. Water kind of has the same symbol in the Bible, doesn't it? With Noah, he's punishing, judging the evil, but he's also saving mankind at the same time. With, Exodus, with the Exodus, he's judging wicked Egypt, but saving wicked Israel at the same time. But they've got the... The blood over their mantle, that, that's what escapes them. Here we go to Habakkuk's day, and God's going to use a, a foreign nation to judge his own people because they're not exempt. He's an equal opportunity judger God. You know, he, he's like, no one's out of this. Yeah, good thought. Absolutely. Any, anyone else? Reminds you of who? Cain, like as in Cain and Abel? Yeah. Okay, great, explain. So, instead of, uh, so God put a mark on Cain's forehead to keep him from his own demise or 
Yep. So you're saying there's mercy, mer- mercy. There's mercy and punishment there. Yeah. You'll. Yeah. Great. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. And here's my point. This language is evoking what? A story. He's putting his current trouble in the context of the redemptive story, and he's finding hope because of that. In fact, let me just skip to the end. I mean, you could do this. We could do this all day. But let me just skip to the end. Look, at, look what happens after he does all this remembering, say, lying, remembering, say, lying, remembering, meditating on. First of all, he's not going very fast. He's stopping and thinking. And look at the end. If I can f- get there. Um, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, is his head in the sand here? No. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, look what he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Now wait a second. This is an agrarian society. What is this? What is this describing in an agrarian society? Economic collapse, absolutely. Famine, economic collapse. And what we know happened was Babylon came and they surrounded the area, cut off their food and water, and they starved them out before they came in and and uh, destroyed the city. I think it was three waves of invasion. And they came and destroyed the city. And look, so in the midst of, so at the end of this prayer, the prayer is not answered in a sense. At the end of this prayer and this thinking and meditating, things are still the same. He says, okay, the fig tree is still, there's still no money in the bank. The economy is still collapsing. Balloons are still flying over, whatever they are up there, or small car object things that we're shooting down. All of these things are happening. Russia's still invading. China's still plotting something. Whatever. All of these things are still going on. It's still happening. My prayers aren't... But because I've been meditating, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I'm trying to... I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. In other words, here's what he's saying. This is not heaven. This is the wilderness. And and horrible stuff happens in the wilderness. There's no figs on the trees. There's no money in the bank. Nations are rising up. They're all a big Babylon. They're super evil. They're greedy. They're building their wealth on the back of slaves. There's all sorts of injustice. Homelessness abounds. My marriage is hard. My kids are turning away. I just lost my job. It's because we're in a wilderness for the way. It doesn't make it any easier, but this is where we're at. He says, and yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in my God. Now, I want you to... Here's what I'm trying to get at. This did not come easy. This here, I will rejoice in the Lord, only came after all of this. All of this. What do I mean by all of this? In the middle of it all, Habakkuk slowed down and used his little gray cells he thought do you know did you know that the bible has more to do with how what you think and how you think than it does with how you feel and look what happened he's sitting there and he's thinking selah no wait let me think about this 
And he remembers what happens to Egypt. And he remembers how God formed his nation out of a really evil regime. And he remembers how he led them through the wilderness. Or he remembers Noah being taken through the waters and landing on Mount Ararat. He remembers all of these things. And as he's sitting there, remembering, remembering, say lying, remembering, say lying, meditating, 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 it wells up and he starts to rejoice. That's the idea. And notice, he says, what is this here? What kind of language is that? Can you see it up there? What is it? Future. Yes, it is future. Well, I know this is now. I will rejoice. But what kind of language is I will? It's volitional. He's making a choice. It, it, in other words, it's not necessarily that he all of a sudden is just overcome with emotion. He's saying, because I'm thinking well, I will rejoice in the midst of this. I'm making a decision to rejoice. I'm making a decision to be joyful in God my Savior. I'm making a decision to believe in, where is it? Um, somewhere in here, he talks about the anoint. oh, right there, the you know who this is? This is a reference to the Mashiach, the Davidic king that will come. That's a future statement. Absolutely. To save your, you came out to deliver your people and to save your anointed one. It's a really simple point this morning, and that is. First of all, slow down and think. And think rightly. Don't let your emotions decide what is true. Challenge your emotions. Is this right? Oh, I, I only have one shot at romance. And this marriage is failing. Stop. Slow down. And tell the story to yourself. What's the story? Oh, the romance I'm looking for is in a future place. There's no man or woman alive presently that can fulfill or scratch the itch that I'm really looking for. Therefore, this wilderness experience, even with my spouse, is preparing me for my to the, for the one that my heart is really longing for. You're putting, in, in context, and all of a sudden your marriage has purpose. Even the hard stuff has purpose. You're being prepared, just like Israel was being prepared in the wilderness for the promised land. Didn't somebody say that? Uh, it took God a day to get Israel out of Egypt, but it took him 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. Same with David, right? David had a wilderness. Saul didn't. Whoo! And Saul's character faults ate him alive. David's will too, let me just say. But he went through a wilderness experience where God was preparing him in the wilderness to be king. So not only is this wilderness just where we're at, but it's preparatory. Whatever you're going through is preparatory. All the calamity that you have seen or maybe that we will see is preparatory. You know what that means? It means life is fraught with hope. Life is fraught with hope. God is using the evil going on to shape you, to mold you, to give you opportunities to grow your character or... It's a wilderness. Some die. I mean, let's, we just got to be real. Some walk away. Some character takes over, depending on our choices in the wilderness. People grumbled in the wilderness. And remember what happened to those people. Hebrews says, I swore, God said, I swore in my wrath you will not enter my rest. And then Hebrews gives this really 
uncomfortable warning. That's what a warning is. It's supposed to be uncomfortable. They say, he, he says, um, beware lest any of you have an evil heart of unbelief. Unbelief. What are we supposed to do in the wilderness, folks? Two, four. The righteous in the wilderness will live by faith, belief. It's the word pistis in the Greek. Or pisteo if it's a verb. And it's a whole-bodied word. It does not mean, in, we've, unfortunately, we've made it simply intellectual. It actually has more to do with allegiance loyalty than it does going to some camp or you know a, a saying a prayer i believe this 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 and this and now like when we get to heaven the angel says oh yes mike monje oh that's right yeah yep montana you came forward to that altar call check okay come on in that's not what it is it's an allegiance to a king saying i'm going to follow you I'm going to give my life to you. I'm going to live by faith. I'm going to follow you in this wilderness. And Jesus also, just to, he came, he came out of water in his baptism. He was led right into a wilderness to prepare him for a cross. And because of that cross, he was exalted. He, he was given, he was he was exalted in the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should, could, should confess. And he says to you and I, follow me. Follow me. What you want is, at the, is after the cross. What you want is resurrection. Right now is the time of the cross, so to speak. Live by faith. And faith makes everything have hope. I will see that person again. I will see Brady again. I will. And he'll show me around and say, you want to talk about adventures? Come with me. That is going to happen. It's not, it's not just something we say. It's real. It's real. In heaven, we'll all be there. Oh, we made it. The promised land. Live by faith now. It gives us strength in this wilderness time. Amen? Did I miss anything? Anybody else want to say something? Add to it? Yeah, Kristen? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, I think you're referring to Hebrews 11. When he's talking about Abraham... By faith, he, uh, let's see. It's after this. For he's looking forward to a city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Yeah. Oh, yes. What verse is that, Kristen? Is that 15? Okay. Chapter 13. Chapter 13. And do not forget to go to others. For we do not have an enduring city. Yeah. In other words, here is here. We do not have an enduring city. Yeah, you make complete sense. I'm, I'm agreeing with you. That's exactly right. Here. You're talking about what I'm talking about. You are picking up what I'm putting down. You are smelling what I'm stepping in. <laughs> Absolutely. Here is not the place. So when we think, America, woo! Well, you know. Yeah, Dave. Uh, mm hmm. Yes, not only so, but we also rejoice. Is rejoicing a, a feelings thing or is it a volitional thing? Yes, we rejoice in our sufferings because we know something. 
We know that suffering does have meaning because it produces perseverance. And perseverance, something we all want, right? We all want character. Absolutely, I do. My goodness, I need it. Character, hope. And hope is not disappointing because it has been poured out. Absolutely, that's a great reference. Yeah, Dave, keep going. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Absolutely. And as Habakkuk, he starts out his chapter with lament. It's basically a, a poetic grumble. How come you're not doing it? And then he stopped and looked at different perspective, and he came out at the other end rejoicing at the end of the book. Oh, excellent. Good thoughts, guys. Anyone else? You got some good perspectives out here. Yeah, Nellie. Okay. Being hidden in Christ. Colossians 1, I think. Um, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints. The faith of the love, I think it's actually, is it chapter 3? Wait, hold on one second. Let me, let me see what Nellie has to say here. We were raised with Christ. You know what verse, Nellie? Is it right in front of my face? What's that? Where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Yes, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Wow, excellent job. Renee, yeah. Yes. Yes. Renee, I can't wait to meet you on the other side. It's good. I love you guys. Let's stand up. Oh, do you guys want this back? You'll have to come get it. Let's close our eyes and have a moment of rest. Say law. Think about your laments. Laments that God does not, he's not uh, rebuking you for. Think of the grief. Think of the confusion. Think of the story. Think of the past. Think of Jesus on the cross. It's what we do when we take communion. And think of the resurrection. you take of communion this morning, know that 
it points that it means suffering has purpose. That evil cannot win. That God can even use that for his good, mysteriously as it may be. There will be a resurrection. Someday all the should have beens will be. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the, the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you in the wilderness, so to speak. I'm taking on the suffering. I'm taking on the evil. So that you can be with me where I'm going. You can hope that. in your present suffering. And he took the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. Your sins are forgiven. The source of all the problems of this world is sin and I'm going to pay for it. If you believe that, if you are in this wilderness, And you are re-signing up today to live by faith. I want you to come up and take communion, but with your wilderness struggles in mind. With the mystery, maybe in the tension. Let it cleanse you. Let it give you hope. Whenever you're ready. shadows deepen we do but do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through we do and do you wish that you could see it all made new we do this all creation grows a new creation coming is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our men and is it good that we remind ourselves of this it is is anyone worthy is anyone Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, oh, he conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor? Is he worthy of this? He is. And does the Father truly love us? And does the Spirit move among us? And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those he loves? He does. And does our God intend to dwell again with us? Oh, he does. Is he?
is anyone worthy? Oh, is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, oh, he conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slain from every people and tribe, every nation and tongue. He has made us a kingdom of priests to God to reign with his son. Oh, is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Yes, he is. He is. Yes, he is. He is. He is worthy. He is worthy of all blessing and honor and glory. He is worthy. He is worthy. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, we look forward to it. It's hard down here in this desert. We look to the day of your coming. There will be no peace, Jesus, until the Prince of Peace comes. You conquer the Lamb. There will be no love until the lover of our souls is here. And then every nation will come to you. We won't have to teach our neighbors know the Lord because all of them will know you. <laughs> we'll beat our weapons into plowshares. The lion will lay down with the lamb. Our children will, will, will play. We'll be over adders' dens and they won't get bit. There will be no disease. There will be just adventures. That is where we're moving to, Lord. So we keep moving. greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. And the guilty pair Bowed down with care, 
you sent your son to win his erring child to me you reconcile and pardon from all sin saints and angels song glory time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call well god's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong redeeming redeeming grace to adam's race the saints and Out, oh, love of God, oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless, how measureless and strong it shall, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels. Could we with ink think about this? The oceans fill, and were the sky of parchment made, were every star on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade. To write the love, to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, nor could the scrolls contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Oh, love of God, oh, love of God. God for that, for your love that is so sure and strong and it wins. It has won. So we live by faith and we enjoy it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Hey, stick around for lunch. Let's be together. Share God's love and good food. And I'm sticking around. Help us put some chairs away and we'll get started soon.